Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Victor, so I'm going to be your uncle for this training. So this is the uh, CompTIA uh, two core-based exams. That's the core one and the core two exams. Uh, I think this should be series six uh, of the training. In the last section, we talked about CPU, we talked about motherboard, we talked about form factors. And today we're going to be looking at power supplies. Now, you cannot have... Normally, we say for PCs, there are two things, power supply and data, or power and data. So everything you have in your system, the only way you can assess your system is to have access either via VGA to see your screen, that is data, to see what is happening. But before you can do that, you have to power up the computer, the laptop, or the desktop, or the mobile. And the curriculum in CompTIA A+, let's say 15, 20 years ago, it used to be called troubleshooting, maintenance, repair. There's a way the acronym used to be. But today it now covers a lot of areas like basic cloud computing, basic mobile troubleshooting, basic PC troubleshooting, basic network, and basic security. If you look at the curriculum, the, the percentages in the exam. So you should be able to understand some virtualization, understand what's cloud computing, uh, how does virtualization help cloud computing. These are some of the additions that you have now. Of course, you have things like uh, security and operation procedures, like professionalism. How should you approach uh, setting up your system, fixing and taking care of your clients? Because this is the typical IT support certification. So today we're going to be looking at power supply because power supply is very important. A very quick story. Somebody brought in some desktops, I think from the US, to be used in a US embassy in a country. Let me not mention what, which of the countries. Now, in most African countries uh, and in some Asian countries, you have their votes power as 220 votes. Then in some countries, some countries in Europe and in US, you have, and maybe in Japan, you have their voltage as, their grid voltage, that is their home consumption units as 110. What will happen is that if you bring a device that uses 110 in Europe or in US or in some other countries, you bring it to Africa or take it to Asia, that their grid is 220, guess what is going to happen? that device is going to blow up. Same thing if you, because of course the voltage is higher, it's like times two. Whereas if you take a system from Africa or Asia and you take it to Europe or US, so you, you have 220, you are taking it to where it is 110, nothing is going to happen and the system is not going to boot up because it needs... Uh, 220, but you are supplying it with 110. Now, power is very critical. And in that case of the US Embassy, they contracted a guy, support tech, the desktop support technician, to come and like set up all of the systems, set up the printer, set up this, set up that, set up that. And the guy gave them the quotation and he said, No, why will you be charging all this amount? To set up our systems we brought from the US to set up in our embassy, blah, blah, blah. And the guy said, Okay, no problem. What happened is that they connected all of the systems. Once they powered on, those systems, they blew up. And they called the guy. Hello, hello, please come. These systems, we have fire. Please come and help us through the system. The guy gave the quotation. They now paid. So this has happened to me also when I uh, think in my university days, there's a, we got some donations for some systems. So I was called to come fix it in the lab, in the mathematics lab. And I didn't check the power switch of the, of the power pack of the desktop. So you have, a, a, what's it called? You have power switch desktop uh, 110 to 220. So you're gonna see something like this behind, behind the laptop. So you want to be very, very careful Okay, good. I think this is big enough. Laptop or desktop? Desktop, I mean to say. You don't have this uh, most of the times in laptops. Laptops most of the times are ad 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 adaptive. So, are you seeing? 
So yeah. there's a switch here that says 220, 230. If you switch it off the other way, you're going to start seeing 115. It that means this power pack has yeah. cap capacity to supply both. There's a small inverter down that steps down, or this sorry, there's a small, there's a transformer inside that steps down the voltage so that you can use this, this boat. If you need to use 220, go ahead. For instance, if your screen is using this, you go ahead. If your screen is using this, you go ahead, depending on what power needs you have. The point I'm trying to make is that power supply is so crucial because if you don't check up properly, you can damage those devices. Yeah. So the goal here in this module is for us to be able to replace appropriate power supply because power supply varies yeah. in features and vary in ratings. Ratings. And we have two types of powers. We call them DC and AC. Right, so DC current is direct current, AC is alternating current. And what this means is that for AC current, the current flows in both ways, but in direct current, it flows only in one direction. So if you say DC versus AC, right, power, these are just two different ways that power moves in the circuit. So if yeah. you look up this image, so the first one, uh, I think this image is kind of poor. Let me use this one. Is this big enough? Okay. Um, in a basic physics, basic electronics. So this is one direction. So the positive. Par par yes. Whereas this one is alternating both ways, right? So this is how you differentiate. And most of the times, if you check, I think it was Thomas Edison or who was that? Um, um, inventor of AC, of DC. I think, okay, yes, Thomas Edison. So Thomas Edison invented direct current in the late 1870s, right? But I think with time, one of the reasons is that it's just like if you have batteries, if you like, if you have inverter batteries, if you have solar panels, if you have your finger batteries, most of these things are DC, right? You really cannot do grid supply. Once this is starts traveling at a very long distance, yeah. you start having a drop. So, and so many other reasons why most of the times we don't use DC for long distance stuff. We use them only for maybe uh, installations that are going to be for just in a place. And you can research other reasons why and see how DC compares to AC. Now, let's see DC, DC versus AC uh, uh, transmission, right? So this is one of the big reasons why AC, your house, most of the appliances you have in your, in your house is going to use AC. AC transmission systems used for short distance uh, uh, transmission. The DC transmission is used for transmission of, of electric power for long distances. The AC transmission lines interfere the nearby communication lines. This transmission does not interfere the communication line. So the give and take of both is what makes it, we're not asking ourselves, which one is not going to be better for transmission? So overall, at the end of the day, if the transmission line route is longer than the break-even distance, this is better option because AC lines have more line losses than DC for bulk power transfer. According to the scientific journal, uh, so I'm not a power expert, but what I've known over time is that and because of these losses, these are the reasons why you have AC transmission in something like 33,000 kV. Then it's not stepped down to, let's say, 11,000 kV. It's not brought to, like, let's say, three and something volt. It's not stepped down to a transformer and maybe to 220 or in some climbs, you now have it as, how was it called, 110. But for the purpose yeah. context, for the purpose of this exam, understand that you have two types of power. Like your USB cable gives you DC, right? Your battery, your laptop battery is DC. Most batteries yeah. are DC. Okay. Uh, so this is what your power pack looks like. So you see the power pack supplies power to different aspects of your computer. It supplies power to your hard disks, 
supply powers to your floppy. This used to be floppy. Uh, if it's not floppy, depending whether it's floppy, floppy or a section of the motherboard, this applies to the hard disk also or the CD-ROM. This applies to the motherboard. There's another part that supplies to the motherboard. So the idea is that this guy, once you connect this guy, this guy supplies power to different aspects of the computer. Supplies to the motherboard, supplies to the CD-ROM, supplies to the hard disk, supplies to the floppy if you have any, and any other uh, item. Of course, it supplies, because it supplies power to the motherboard, the USB, you have them on the motherboard. So once you plug your phone or you plug a camera, or you plug a speaker, you plug any device, you can also collect power. Yeah. That, power is going to be, that power is going to be um, transferred via the USB. Yes, 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 yes. So understand that power is rated in watts. And the more watts, the more supply. So you see some computers, their rated power desktop is, let's say, 250 watts. The bigger form factors are going to be needing more, 350, 500. Same thing for laptops. If you use a smaller laptop, look at the rating of your power supply. You're going to be seeing 25, 35, 45. Like mine, I think mine is 45, 45 watts. So if your laptop is a little bit bigger, you're going to be needing 80 watts. You see some laptops. I think a student got a laptop just recently. You're going to see things like 100 and something, especially if it's a gaming system, especially if it's a system that is going to be needing a lot of power. And you're going to see the adapter is going to be a little bit bigger, right? So yeah. that's why the goal here is as a technician, if you are going to be doing changes, if you're going to be doing troubleshooting, you don't just swap powers. You must make sure that you use the label attached to the power supply to determine the wattage ratings and what is safe. Because once you use what is less than needs, what will happen? You don't have issues. It goes off. Yeah. If you use what is more than needs, that's where you're not going to have a big challenge. So reading power supply is very, very crucial. Now, wattage versus amperage. So amperage is your current. So we say current is flow of electricity, our basic physics. We say wattage is our voltage and a, a, a combination of our voltage and our current. Ohm's law helps us to understand most of these uh, uh, formulas. Okay, I love using this particular one. So this is not really within the scope of the cost, but it's a good thing for you to understand. So voltage, if you want to get voltage, is the same thing as power, which is in watt, power divided by current. If you want to get voltage, you can also say current times resistance. Resistance is calculated as the um, opposition to flow of electricity. Like I normally tell students, if you have this wire, for instance, this wire is a VGA cable, this wire, it's yeah. a, a HDMI cable. So this wire now, if I ask you, these two wires, which is going to have a higher resistance? What's going to be your answer? The HDMI, no, the, uh, the other one, not the HDMI. The VGA. Okay, the video will be because of the size. The, I'll choose the HDMI. So the HDMI will have higher resistance. Yes. So the HDMI correct is going to oppose flow of electricity. So if you give it more electricity, it's going to fight that. One way it's going to fight that is going to expand to try to take in more. If it's expanding and it's not working, it's going to do what? It's going to fry up. So the bigger the cable, the more electricity that can flow in. So engineers, uh, technicians, these are basic things you should know in terms of your wire size. Take, for instance, you want to have three computers connected to an extension box. But the extension box is rated 2,500 watts. Now, you have three computers that your power pack is rated 500 watts. That's not a good deal. Yes, most 
extension boxes will allow for a like kind of give, give some kind of efficiency and allowance and overage. But the point is that it's not going to act like that in all circumstances. So you can see a fire like burning, getting uh, uh, so power is very, very important. So you want to look at those ratings so that you understand what uh, you, you are supplying. I think I've talked about the 115 and the 220. So most computers, especially desktop, and in some laptops, for instance, the adapters, they are going to tell you that I need 115 volts. So you must make sure that you are giving them 115 volts. If you give them 220 volts, it will burn. Okay. So that's the most important. Uh, so the computer A plus exam covers 110 to 120, 220 to 240. Now, but in the last five, six years, seven, we barely have step down transformers and step up transformers in home usage and maybe most office enterprises. Step up versus step down transformer home use. So you need a step up transformer if you need to supply and deliver higher voltage. That would be for a step up. Yes, yeah, step up. So you need a step down if you need to deliver at the world at the lower voltage. Lower, well, yeah. Yes. So it's, it's just most devices, they look like this. They're very common. They used to be very common, but you don't see them. Some devices still use them. If you get to the market, you're going to see it. 220 is written this other side. This thing, it, they used to be common those days, even in, uh, in the houses, some houses. Yes, 110, you see 110. But what happened? Why is it no longer common? Most manufacturers now manufacture their devices to be able to have a transformer, a mini transformer within the device. So the transformer checks if I'm getting 220 and this device, I need 120, it takes it up. If I get to a country where I need 110, sorry, where it is 120, but I am 110, what do I do? I step it down. So we typically, that's why you're going to see some appliances, TVs, gadgets, you're going to see their power rating as 110 to 220 to 30. So what it means okay. is that if you're in the US, you're good to go. If you're in Asia, you're good to go. If you're in Europe, you're good to go. If you're in Africa, you're good to go. Whatever continent, wherever, whatever type of transmission line you have in that country, you are all good to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I've explained this already. I've shown you this. So this is where you have a switch. This is 115, this is 220. So if you are in the country where you need 110, you do what? You switch. If you're in a country where you need 220, you just switch. If you don't switch. do the switching, you blow this power pack. So it's going to take in more than uh, necessary, more than required. In your exam, you're going to see questions that have to do with the first thing you need to do before you even start maintaining troubleshooting or trying to check up a system. But the first thing you want to do is to disconnect power supply. Make sure power supply is not connected. Yeah. Make sure it is disconnected. If it's for laptops, aside disconnecting power supply, you want to take off the batteries. That's the first two steps you need to do before any other thing. Well, for laptops where the battery is sealed, how do you do that? You need to open and take off the battery still. Yes, you need to take up, unscrew, and take off the battery. Best practices, standard practice. Now, for motherboards, for desktop, you have what we call the 20 pin and 24 pin, right? Depending Sorry, on. Sorry, excuse me. Even with your electrostatic uh, uh, wrist, yes. strap, you still need to take off the battery. Yes, yes, yes. Now, the idea now is not you on the devices or the items or the components. is the power that is left over in the power pack or in the battery. Battery. 
on those devices. Electrostatic, okay. electromagnet, electrostatic, uh, electrostatic. Uh, strap. That strap is going for to you. protect is protect you protect those devices against the charge of you. Yes. Uh -huh. So once you have that, I, another way to do it, like a shortcut, is to just make sure that you put your hands on the metallic, metallic. part of the yes, or the computer, so that you have the same potential difference, kind of. You are yeah. the same charge level. That's why you see during the hammer time, during um, if you do this way, you have some charge. You can stones can even I know. you can have dust sort of stuff. So you have different devices at different dif potential difference, different charge level. So. A device that has a less charge level, if you bring a higher device or bring a body on it, it can have some kind of shock. And that's why some components can go bad. So your, your electrostatic strap, that guy, wrist strap, that guy is going to protect you against, so you just wear it before you do anything so that and you put that part on the metallic portion, right? You put it on the metallic portion, right? Sure. While you're doing anything. So, like I said, the shortcut without this guy is just make sure your hands is always on this, on this, but on this top. So this is what the 24 pin looks like. This is a little bit older. This is newer. So newer desktops is going to come this way. So this is an auxiliary power. So this is like to supply additional power to the board or a, a part of the motherboard. This is also an additional. So newer laptop, newer desktops are going to have this and this. Older computers are going to have just these ones. Some of them have this and another one, depending on the form factors. So on the power pack, a power pack that have that is within two generations. Is going to have the two options so that depending on what the motherboard requires, it can be powered. So the newer one, the newer ones now comes with all three of these other ones. Just this and this, or this and this, depending. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to see different. The different pins tells you the different um, the power they represent. Pin one, right? Uh, 3.3 volts, 3.3 volts, ground wire black, retaining clip, that is this five, just to make it snapping properly. Uh, so that's that. So one thing you should understand is that the, the power supply is what powers all of these guys. I've already talked about that. This hard disks, the yeah. sync drives, the fans, because you got to ask yourself, where is the all of these items getting power from? So if there's no power on the motherboard, of course the system cannot start, and all of these guys cannot be powered up. True. So you see, like I explained in early, earlier times, so this goes to the board, goes to the board, this goes to the board, this goes to the hard disk, this goes to the board. At times, uh, some devices can have this connector or for floppies, older devices, you can see something like this. Molex. What's that big? Yes, Molex is for older, um, uh, what's it called? Older, um, um, older hard disks and CD-ROM. It looks like this. Molex. Uh, uh, port versus SATA port hard disk. So older desktop hard disk we have. Let me. I want to show you the two. So this is SATA. This is how the SATA looks like. You see the power connector for SATA. Sorry, the power connector for SATA or SATA. Yeah. There for. The Molex, yes, this is the Molex. So the port is that way, just a second. This is still SATA, still SATA, still SATA. 
this is more x. Good. This is this is more x. Are you there? Yeah. So this older hard disk. This one, for instance, have two options. So this is a hard disk that is within transition in generation. You know, when you have devices that are between generations, they are going to have both options. So this this is this hard disk have you option to power this and this, or power this and this. This is power. Let me look for another one. Uh, awesome, this is it. I see it. A second. So this is power. Then this is SATA. Mm -hmm. This is power connector in the Molex. This is SATA power, SATA data. Sorry, SATA power, SATA data. SATA connector, yeah. Now, for older desktop, you see these jumpers here? Yeah, they're used for configurations. This will tell okay. if you have, let's say, two, two, uh, what was it called? Two uh, hard disks. On this system, where you plug in this jumper, it's just like a pin. You put it in, and you see the you see the configuration on the behind this desktop. Where you put it will tell yeah. which of this hard disk is going to boot first, and which one is going to boot second. It can also tell which of these hard disks is going to be the primary hard disk. Okay. Hard disk. Jumper configuration label. Can you see this? So you will see a pin, right? That pin, yes, I can. If you put the pin into this place like this, if it enters here, that means like this, here, yeah, this too. If it enters here, what it means is that this hard disk is going to be the master. So on your on your on your my computer, you're going to see the hard disk is going to be where your C drive is, where you're going to boot the operating system. The window. Yeah, yeah, that's where your Windows is going to be. Now, if you don't put anything on it, no pin for this particular hard disk brand. What is this, this is that this hard disk is the second hard disk or the third hard disk or the fourth hard disk and it's going to be slave. It mm -hmm. that it's not the main hard disk, maybe just for backup or something. You want to be storing videos, files, and the rest of it. So once the okay. system is booting up, it's not going to boot from there. It's going to boot from this guy. Then, of course, this one is cable select. Like, find your way. Or depend on what the BIOS yeah. UEFI is saying. So you don't have all of this again. Really, you barely have this kind of hard disk again. Most of the hard disks you see around now is what? SATA hard disks. And you do all of the configurations within your BIOS. We've talked about BIOS in the last class. Okay, so don't forget that your powers are going to be what? 3.3, 5 volts. Your USB is 5 volts. USB is how many volts? Five. That's why your USB can power phones, cameras, speakers, small, small gadgets, right? Five volts DC. Your USB is going to be able to power that. Any device, have you seen an external hard disk before or an external uh, CD ROM? Any external, yes. system, external hard disk, yes, that is small, you will see that just one cable to USB is going to power it. Anyone that is big, it will need you to also add power. That means it needs more than five volts. Okay. So the USB cannot just provide the power. So the USB will be only for file transfer. 
you need to plug it and power it on before it can work. So just understand that in your PC, you have different voltages and what they can be used to, what they can power. For Molex, do they have five volts? Can they supply five volts? Yes. Can they supply 12? Yes. Can they supply 3.3 volts? No. Used today primarily for case fans no. that do not connect to the motherboard or they can be adapted to SATA drives. Bed, used for power for some add-on cards. So there are some cards, like your video graphics card, your sound card. If they need to have Expansion power, card. power, so they will have a port where you can, from the power pack, you can add to it and it will supply power. Then, of course, SATA requires using a Molex to SATA. That means a converter, something that looks like this. Molex to SATA. It then means that the 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 collect the power pack you have is Molex, but your hard disk is SATA. So you plug it here and you plug it to your device. That way you can solve that issue. In case you have a or you have a newer hard disk, you want to put a newer yeah. hard disk on an older desktop, right? Okay. So of course you have other several and older uh, connectors. So color codes is good to know them uh, for, uh, for for idea for knowledge sake. Red is five volts, yellow. So these are conventions that are used for most manufacturers. If a manufacturer is doing USB, they follow standard. If a manufacturer is doing CAT five, CAT six, CAT seven, CAT eight cables, they follow standard. If a manufacturer is doing RAMs, they follow standards. If a manufacturer is doing hard disks, they follow standard. So this is like the standard, like in car tracking. For the, to, for the colors. Yes, if you want to do car tracking, for instance, see somebody trying to get power for the tracker from the car. And if you check your, like I told a guy to work on my AC one time, and I see the way he was just like, because you have a lot of cables. Once he opened, the other part of the of the driver's side under the steering, you see a lot of cables, you see green, red, blue. Yeah, yeah. Those things, they have each of those wires have their color convention. If somebody has to do car tracking, is to tap five volts for the car tracker. You cannot just start pa, 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 start cutting all of the wires to trace, or you start cutting all the wires to test with your multimeter, which one is going to give you five volts? By the color, you should know. Yes, by the color, you should know. So, but the question is that who is going to have the time now to not study the technical documentation for the car wiring system? To now know that all green is so, so, so volts. So you take the green and you take the earth, or you take the green and you take the this. How many persons are going to know? Exactly. So, you have convention. So most of them is going to be a lot of trial and error. So they're going to cut all of the wires, cut them open a bit, use the multimeter to check. And once they get five volts, then they cannot close up the rest of the wires. I told the guy, I said, please cover it up. Take this amount of money. Refer me to somebody that can help me fix this. The guy was just like shocked. What is happening? <laughs> but <laughs> he couldn't say anything because I gave him a, 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 a tip. He did not do nothing. He did not work. And I still gave him benefit of also referring me to somebody else that can fix it. So yeah. He, there's there's nothing more to say. So the guy just he just gave up. Because I told him that my car hasn't gotten to that stage. <laughs> You're going to <laughs> cut. <laughs> That's all the way. Yes. So these are conventions, these are standards, right? So red is 5 volts, yellow is 12 volts. You can memorize them or you, you, you check up documentations anytime you need to do or you have for it. Don't, don't, be, don't do, be like that or that guy that I have to tell to close up everything. Why are these uh, exam questions, do you think? No, typically you won't see this kind of thing, exams. 
uh, which color code is this and whatever. So you should be, your question should be around uh, what power ranges, what kind of power can, will you have on your, so if you, if you start seeing things like 15 volts, power supply don't supply 15 volts, right? So these are the standard ratings they supply. So you see five, you see, you see 12, you see 3.3 for those sound cards or floppy for older systems and some other things. Uh, then you see your 12. Yeah, that, that's true. Rooms. Are you there? So just knowing, knowing the, the voltage power can supply. Yes. Will help you rule out any 15, 20. Good, if good, you know good, that good. It's 5 volt, 12 volt, and 3 volt. Yes, yes. It's just like you know, those now will be distractive questions. Good. So it's just like you're telling me now that a device needs 450 volts. Yeah. So it's either that guy is a three phase or a two phase or is something. So it's it's not a regular supply, right? So your regular supply is going to be either the 110 or the 220. So if you are going to have it in more than one phase, then it's a different ball game altogether. Maybe you're going to be supplying to different part of the building. So that to do load separation, you don't have. I mean, I'm talking about home home wiring systems and the rest. But when it comes to PC, like, like one of those questions from what you sent me that I did today, there was one that was asking like, uh, uh, there are two processors using hundred. Uh, there's another. Uh, what was that? I uses uh, nine volt, five for feet. Then at the end, I now said like how many? Then there was something again that needed like uh, two hundred. Uh, well, then at the end, how many do you think can accommodate that? Which I chose 500 to accommodate two of the hundreds, um, five of the nines, which is 45, and then the other one, 200. Good. Yeah, about uh, 400 and there. Good. So you see, it's just like what I talked about an extension box that yes. is rated 1,250 watt. And you have three desktop computers that is rated 500 watt each. God will help you. Nothing might happen when you've done the installation. Why? CD-ROM is not in use. Right? Yeah. Or some other additional peripherals on the system is not in use. That power pack is not going to draw in 500 watts. No. It will draw in a little bit less than. God will not help you after three months. <laughs> 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 All the three systems are working and everybody is gaming. So the three computers are going to be needing the entire, the power pack is going to be collecting, it will be needing the entire 400 or something or almost 500 watts. Yeah. That extension box or that power supply will not be able to serve. And what is going to happen? You have an issue. Nice. So when you are designing keep things and have some kind of redundancy either you have duplicates or you have miscellaneous right don't always don't always supply exactly what you need have redundant yeah. power supply in a resilience we call this you want to ensure business continuity you want to make sure that if something fails Another way you can also ensure this is by having UPS systems, right? Is by having uh uninterrupted power supply, right? So if you see a yeah. question that has to do with oh that you have this, you want to ensure that there's continuity, there's no whatever. What are you going to do? Is it to get a second system? Is it to get an inverter, a UPS system? Is it to wait for the disaster to happen? Then you now know what needs you are going to. What are you going to do next? Your asset is typically going to be first. You have to make sure that you have redundant power supply. Okay. You have UPS or you have an inverter system so that once power goes off, you can actually um, continue operation. Okay, so this has to do with uh, mostly uh, different power supplies. Okay, so we're going to look at uh, uh, multifunction devices, printers and settings. So let's look at printers a little bit and look at our SOHO, that is our simple, uh, our small 
office home office uh uh small sorry home small office. office is this small yes yeah, small home office. office home, home office. office right so that's what you call it so yes. at times when you talk about a soho network are you talking about a network that is going to feed a family or an yeah. SME or a small business right Okay, so let's look at uh, printers um, and printer settings. Now, the idea is that if you have personal computers, um, you might need to share resources. And that's where a network comes in. So a network is going to help you to share things like printers, things like internet, things like device devices, gadgets, hard disks, CD-ROMs, whatever. Yeah. So... In a small network, you might need to do scan, you might need to do some fax systems and the rest. So unboxing your device, looking at what location, this is very discretionary. If it's going to be most likely you want to put it in a very central area or you want to put it in a place in one computer, then of course you now share the printer on the network so that every other person can now add the printer as a network printer. So the printer, sorry. So a printer, you go to printer and scanner, you can say I want to add a printer. So there are two ways to add a printer. You can add a printer as a device, right? Or you can add yeah. it as a, network printer so i would say adding so if i say i want to add my printer so it's going to ask me is it a local printer here or is it a printer on the network so the two ways you can add a printer of course before you add a printer i want to make sure that the device driver is installed what's a device driver so the device driver is that software that aids the hardware to communicate with your world your operating system so if it's a printer the question is, how is it going to communicate with your operating system? How is it going to communicate with Microsoft Word, your browsers, your, your, your software, where you're going to be printing from? How is it going to communicate? So it's that device driver. So once you install the device driver, it then means that this printer can communicate with your operating system. When you send a command, the printer can understand. So, But there are printers you call plug and play printer, right? Plug and, plug and play. play. Yeah. So what it means is that you just plug it. The driver is by default available on the base of printing systems, right? So this is not it's not seen any printers. I'm going to say add manually. So if I select add manual, it's going to now ask me how are you going to install this printer? So my printer is a little bit older. Help me find it, or I have shared this printer on this network. Or I want to add a printer by IP address, it then means that that printer is a wireless printers, printer. Or the printer has Bluetooth, or it's a local printer or a network printer. So any option you select, if I say Bluetooth, I'm going to say next, it's not going to start searching for the printer. Of course, you next, 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 and you install. Yeah. Printer. So when it comes to printers, printers come in different shapes and sizes. And even at that, there are different ways you can configure your printer. There was a printer I used to have, uh, let's say, 13 years ago. That particular printer, I used that printer for like five years before I could tell that that printer can do duplex printing. Right? Really? Yes. I, I never knew. By the time I now knew, <laughs> I was so glad because it then means that you can select, once I say control P, if that particular printer can do that function, I don't have any printer installed here. Most times I don't use this uh, computer for anything printing. I just save as PDF and I send out and print, printing is done elsewhere. Now, if I, if I, if I, if I had a printer, installed on this particular computer, I can decide, I cannot do more settings and uh, 
But since I don't have it, so I'm going to do all of those settings. So if I select the particular printer, then I can now start doing the configuration. So I can now select duplex printing. Once I select duplex printing, it then means if I have 100 pages, I can fit in only 50 pages. What is going to happen is going to pick up the paper, is going to print on the front side, take it back, print on the back side, drop that, take up the second one, print. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So you use less paper. Then, so how do you know it, it? How do you know the printer works that way? Perfect uh, manual. If you say um home printers with duplex printer, duplex printer. Let's say I love HP, right? It'll give me all of the series of printers that can do that particular stuff, right? So printers, duplex printer, uh, HP printer. So NV460 has wireless, has a three months instant ink, blah, blah, blah. It will tell you all of the series of printers. Or if you just pick up the model and check up, then it will tell you whether it can do duplex printing or not. If we, if we click on this, if we click on this printer, we can see the features. So you want to be looking at the features. If a printer by configuration cannot do that, there's no magic. You have to manually do that. Yeah. Take for instance for this guy now. Um, copy scan automatic two side printing and thirty five page auto loader. It then means that it can take thirty five pieces of paper. So you cannot put in a whole ring five hundred pieces. Whereas some printers they can take a lot of more papers at the time. Yeah. So work with a smartphone or tablet. That means if you have a smartphone, you can add them via Bluetooth and you can send to print and they will pick up and they will print. So basically as a technician, you don't have all the knowledge. So you, you, you need to learn how to do a lot of research. You need to learn how to do a confirmation. You're going to troubleshoot a printer. What do you need to do? You pick up the printer model and get the technical manual. Take for instance, if I say HP MV this, I just need to say technical manual, technical manual, file type, PDF. And I'm going to get the exact technical manual for this printer. And I'm going to know almost everything I need to know about this printer. So before I even go to site, before I even meet the client, before I even get to the office where the particular person had this challenge, I can't even know what the printer looks like and what the printer can do and what the printer cannot do. Yeah, that's true. Because so you're the, prepared already. Come again. Because you're prepared ahead, though. Yes, and it doesn't take you... See, it just took me a second to get this. I can take me the next 30 minutes, even while I'm driving or somebody is driving me to the location. And in 15 minutes, you can have an understanding of what this printer can do, what it cannot do. I can also say this review, you too, and you would have seen somebody that would have reviewed this particular printer. How to set it up, how to put in the ink, how to do. So we're, we're in the age, so much. we're in the age where you don't have to do all of. So when the, are you a professional looking to immigrate legally to the United States? Today we're going to talk. So we're in the age where you don't need to have all of the information to be able to do all of the stuff. Look at now, you you learning here how to set up the Wi-Fi, how to unbox, how to put the ink how to do the basic scan alignment, then, and all of that, just in six minutes. Regarding HP NY Pro 6430 only one printer. So, are you there? Yeah. So, technical manuals are very important. Unboxing, setting up printer, looking at what, what orientation, what kind of print quality you're going to have. You can always have all of that, uh, those information. Then there are some printers also that support serial and some support USB. So serial is a type of cable, looks like your VGA port, right? Something like this. So some printers have this option. So mostly printers. So, but if you are going to connect this to your laptop, then means you need a serial 
to USB adapter. So because your laptop would most likely don't have this, uh, some older desktops are going to have this. So if that's available, you do that. If that's not available, you USB. And if it's not available, then you need a converter. So this to USB, so that you can now plug into your laptop. What if this your your code is not as uh, based on the distance where you want to put the printer? Maybe you're on a site. How do you extend it if it's not as the distance? Or you need to you must have look for a cord that will be as uh, the distance so can cover. If the distance is too long, you network. You you put you make sure the printer your system is on, on a network. Install the printer on a system. Then, if you need to print in the other room, you add that system to this network. Then you cannot add that this printer as a network printer on that system, then once you print, you come here and pick up. Oh, the way this cyber cafe guys used to do it before, right? Come again? Yeah, that's the way this cyber cafe guys do sure, this. Sure, 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 sure. So these are basic setups for your printers. So it's going to slightly differ depending on the printer type. Like I've shown you, the technical manual is very important. A short four or five minutes YouTube video unboxing and setup is very important because each printer is going to be slightly different. But the process will always be to unbox, to fill in the cartridges or the toner, depending, and to install the driver, then do your test print, test alignment, then you now start your printing. So this is if we are going to run it as a network printer. So some printers have uh, scanning to email or scanning to PDF or scanning to PNG. So in the printer software, you're going to see that option. So once you tap on it, you want to scan and send it to an email, you enter the email, it goes, or you want to scan it to a PDF, or you want to scan it to a PNG file. So printer technologies are consumables. So what do you call consumables? At times you call them FRUs. So FRUs are field replaceable units, right? Field replaceable units. So some of your field replaceable units are your toners, right? Your, your transfer belts, your pickup rulers. So some of these items, once they get bad, you don't fix them. You do what? You replace. Toner crack cartridges, once they get bad, you do what? You replace. So you have what we call the monochrome. So monochrome is what? Single color, that is black. Then when you say colored print, it then means that you could have the three blue uh, or magenta, magenta, uh, magenta and, uh, and um, I think blue. Three color pr uh, printer. Uh, cartridges. So those primary colors, they, they are com once they are combined, they can now have cyan, magenta, and yellow. So with these three colors, you can have then of course and uh, black. So with that, you can have you can typically have any other color, right? Those three. Yeah. Colors, which typically looks something like a red, 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 blue. Let me see. Forgotten my primary colors. Primary colors. Red, blue, yellow. Red, blue, yellow. So this is like the magenta. This is like the blue. This is like the, what's the third one? Cyan. Okay, let me see. Cyan, magenta, yellow versus primary. Okay, 
versus this area will be blue. So cyan is close to blue, magenta is close to red. Then, so it's just a way to have the primary colors produce any color because the pr primary colors can get to any color, right? So that's how print technology works. When you change a toner cartridge, take care to avoid getting toner on your face, hand, clothing. It leaves a messy residue and it's hard to clean. Uh, Lisa. So Lisa is going to typically use toner. So Lisa, it's not like ink jet. So one thing you need to know in uh, when it comes to printers, you need to understand the different types and the different features and their durability. So lasers are going to be more durable. They're going to be able to do more industrial stuff compared to inkjets, uh, which will typically do small prints, home prints, Soho prints, and all of that. So uh, you need to understand the process in laser print imaging, uh, master the details of each step and their sequence, prepare to answer troubleshooting questions around these steps. So you're going to see questions that have to do with how do you troubleshoot the printer? Maybe that's not printing or cannot pick up paper or can pick up paper, but it's not bringing out a clear print. What might be the issues? Will it be, will it be the toner? Will it be the picker? Will it be the roller? Will it be the toner? Will it be all of that? So you want to be familiar with that for your exams. Because the, the job of a technician is to do what? Is to fix problems that has to do with tech usage, tech appliance, tech gadget usage, from your printers, to your desktop, to your laptops, to your screens, to your mobiles, to your tablets. So because laser printers are page-based, a printer must receive an entire page before it can start printing. After the print page has been received, the printer pulls a sheet of paper into the print and feeds its roller. But one thing you should understand is that for big printers, they have their own dedicated memory. It then means that once okay. you send something to a printer, you could take off the cable and you're gone. It's going to hold that in memory and it's going to also print that even when the cable is not connected. So printers do have memory. Right? So printer memory can range from 4 MB to 128 MB. So of course, okay. the bigger printers are going to have larger memory so they can do what they can do a lot of complicated tasks they can keep stuff they can know where they stopped that's why sometimes you see some printers once power goes off and once power is restored they continue printing yes now you see some printers when uh you you decide and say okay i don't want to print something again you cancel it but you didn't cancel it and take it off the pool what's going to happen is that once you put in paper it, it continues printing continue printing so they do have memory So the seven steps is what? Uh, printing, charging, exposing, developing, transferring, fusing, and cleaning. That's the seven process in laser printing. So for example, you want to understand that, understand the sequence. Processing, charging, exposing, that has like writing, then developing, transferring, fusing, and cleaning. So you have an image that describes uh, what happens uh, once the paper comes in, where is step one? Step one, step two, three. Okay, I think this is uh, items. Uh, step one, processing, charging, exposing, developing, transferring, fusing. And seven, you have cleaning. Okay, so then make sure you know the parts that make up a laser printer, the imaging drum, the developer, the fuser assembly, the transfer belt, and the transfer roller. So uh, the pick-up pick rollers, the separation parts, the duplexing assembly. So that duplexing assembly is the guy that's going to be able to do the, the, the reverse. So once it picks it, that's the guy that's going to now pick it up again and send it back so that it can now enter. So for smaller printers that cannot do that function, they won't have that particular part. So for your reader, okay. so this is an explainer of each of the process, right? Processing, charging, exposing, developing, tra 
transpired fused flaming, right? Yeah. Uh, color laser printer differences. Like I said, you have cyan, magenta, yellow, and what? Black. Those are the colors that you have. So this is it. So what happens is that this guy, once it's fed into it, so this guy is now going to be picking this is a different section. Paper part one, right? Two cleaning oh. units. You know, you ask yourself, how is it that? What is it cleaning? Yes, because once it's not creeps enough, or if that part is bad, you are going to see that you are going to have terrible lines on your print. You are going to see that you have color, but your color is not. It's not like. It's not distinct and it's not legible enough. You can start it's trying to be a little bit broad. Mm. So you have all of different parts explained. Laser media types. Uh, so laser printers use standard smooth finish printers or copier papers, and they come in different grams. So you can have uh, 70, 75, 80 gram. So and each printer will tell what paper type that it can take. So there are some printers that cannot take uh, very high uh, paper sizes. So you should be aware of that. So because if you put it in, the ruler will not be able to pick up the, the uh, it's not be able to pick up the paper and send it into the system. So the grammage is very important. If I say printer, HP that can take 100 gram paper. Are you seeing? Yeah. This guy, HP, whatever, whatever, can take what? Sorry, moment. That can print you see somebody's asking can 200 gram go through a printer so if you check very well, yes if you check very well that's going to be a very thick paper if you check very well, you are now going to see the kind of printers that can take that. So all of these things lie in documentation, right? Mm -hmm. Very, very critical. Uh, list, uh, list up maintenance. So some of the some of the tasks you're going to be doing when it comes to printers is to replace the toner, is to change the inks, and, um, and each printer, have how much prints they can do per minute or how many prints they can do per hour. So the technical documentation is also, also going to tell us that. Okay, if I say HP DexJet 2710 print per, per minute. So 7.5 page per minute. Are you there? Yeah. If it has color, 5.5 .5 page per minute. So if you times it by 60, you can tell how many pages you can print in one hour. This is 270101. Let me see HP 5. Are you there? 810. Yeah. I seen uh I have 7.5 per minute in black and 4.5. So I just pray this is the correct item. So but technical documentation is always good. It's good, always going to tell you how fast the printer is. 
If the printer is under a service contract or is being charged on per page, it is not recommended to reset paper count after servicing. However, most laser printers print the page count when you perform a self-test, right? So this, 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 this idea is, has to do with professionalism. Uh, in case, let's say a company is contracted to do service after every 5,000 prints, right? They charge the company an amount to service all of the printers. Some printers are set at 2,000. Some are set at 100, 1,000. Some are set at 2,000. Some are set at 3,000. So the company is paying. So you're not to reset. It's just like your car, when you drive your car. Somebody's going to drive a car and drive it to like 100 uh, kilometer, uh, miles, kilometers per kilo, kilometer or whatever, and they reset it. So if they reset it, what happens? So it means that the next person is not going to know have a good idea about what has happened before then. So it's always going to be guessing. Okay, print calibration. So uh, at times you can do this, uh, most of the times, uh, software-based or hardware-based. If it's going to be software-based, each printer is going to have its own software. So once you have a printer, let's say this is a printer. Okay, I need to go pick up my charger just a moment. So uh, print quality is affected by many factors, such as print resolution for graphics, the higher the dot per inch. I hope I got this correctly. So that has to do with um, uh, how much color is going to be in the space, right? It's like in screen sizes where you talk about How how creeps how I think we when we looked at screen size we looked at resolutions we talked about one uh, K two K four K eight K talked about HD uh, FHD that is full HD in printing we use dot per inch. You uh, use what? In okay, printing, dot, per yeah. dot per inch. So it's a measure of the resolution used in printed text or images, the more dots per inch, the higher the resolution. In okay. graphics, at times you say pixel. Pixel, is it for camera? Yes, it's still the same. Um, okay, yeah, because of the resolution, the yes, the, the images. The, the so imagine images. if your camera, if your camera, like most phones now, regular phones, if it's not a picture, you're going to get two, three, four MB. Yeah. If you use a normal camera, you can get up to 20 MB. Yeah. Like I have a Canon, a D600. If I take a photo with that one, I get up to like 30, 40. There are some very okay. high-end cameras. If you just take a photo, you're going to be getting, let's say, 100 MB. So it's a resolution. It then means that that camera, that printer that has a higher dot per inch can do yeah. more sharper resolution, more clear, neater images, right? Yeah, the person that has the lower. Yes, for phones, if you just zoom out a bit, it gets start getting blurred. For normal cameras, if you still zoom up, you can still get something tangible. For high-end cameras, you can go snap a picture and you just do a billboard and it will still come out clear. Yeah. So printers are going to have several, how sharp they are going to be, their print qualities and the rest. So in print quality, you have different mode, which can reduce the quality like economy, like yeah. full mode, color mode. So when you use economy, most of the time you can make it come out in gray and or it can come out in just one color. So these are things that you should look at, understand. Then this is cleaning. Um, 
inkjet printers. So inkjet printers are for small businesses. You don't use them for large scale uh, enterprise. Printing. Physical, basic, basically to do small prints. Um, like small offices or home use. Yeah, small offices or home. So this describes the inject in, in inject process. Same thing for the media type. So paper sizes can also be used for later for Lisa, but most of the times, uh, the uh, uh, what's it called? The grammage has to be smaller. Uh, so that it can get into the machine. Okay. Replacing cartridges. Most of the times when your cartridge is slow, you're going to get an alert by the print software that you installed uh, when you were installing the, the software of the... That, okay, so, so so particular yeah. is slow that you need to... Either replace. the black or the, yes. the color yeah. is slow. So you need to be looking at and checking the print color uh, levels. And of course, the printer is going to have several, several uh, what they call configurations within the software. So you can set all of that. They have thermal printer, so this is going to do high quality printing, right? Right. Most of the times, uh, but one disadvantage is that they use heat transfer. They don't use color. So POS machines. Thermal printers. So this is what you call thermal printers, right? That's why oh, okay. if you have something that comes from a thermal printer, this slip, uh, the printout, what will happen is that because it's heat, it's not color. So it has a lifespan. So a few days. Thermal printout, print out lifespan. Black and white. Yes, yeah, sometimes some of them come in colors. But the thing is that paper. Uh, what are these guys telling me? Paper prints. No, so PS is a uh, Tama. Yes, PS tam Tama. So most of the times it doesn't just few few days and it's going to like clean up. Even some shops too. Uh, retail shops, grocery shops, they use the Yes, yeah, so once they use that stuff, so if you want to archive, uh -huh, why does print taken by Tamar fade away? How long does it, okay, so let's check this out. So most of the times, few, few days, and if you're not careful, the print is gone. So if you need to record, you might need to scan that, or you might need to snap it. Uh, so that uh, if you don't come back the next day, where I try to look at the prints on the on the printout, and all of those things are gone. Okay, what's happening to my internet? Yeah. Uh, ATM printers are made by a simple printing method called thermal. Continuous exposure to sunlight generates a lot of heat. Much. Okay, much above the melting point of these coatings. Are you there? So once they're exposed yeah. to heat, those coatings goes off and they will fade away. So once they fade away, it's difficult for it to now read. Uh, that's why they are called thermal. So they are, they are printed by heat. And once you have heat, you have sunlight, you have exposure to weather, they will fade away, right? So you should understand. So this is what it looks like. So this is the process. So will this one be like uh, exam questions or this is for knowledge basis? Yeah, so mostly you want to look at the technology, the different types. Um what maintenance features uh should you be concerned about? Then uh what should you use for which kind of situation? So we're looking okay. at printers now. We're looking at thermal printers. We're looking at inkjet printers. We're looking at laser printers. If you have to do very brick printing for maybe a shopping system or for for inventory system or for whatever, thermal printer will be your best case. 
for a small yeah. business and all of those other, depending on the uh, printing requirements, of course, um, uh, what's it called? Um, uh, inkjet printers will do the job. Then if you're going to do large scale enterprise printing, you're going to print a social number of thousands of prints uh, within a short laser. time or whatever, then LaserJet is going to do the job for you. So you want to know their differences, know how to maintain them, then know how to, um, which is going to be best case bet for whichever kind of scenario that you have. So those are the things that, they will have what we call the, um, the impact printer. So this is majorly mechanical. So at times some people call it the chaka 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 chaka. So some people call it the what? Chaka 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 chaka. <laughs> so this is one of the oldest technology. Chaka chaka chaka. Yes. This is one of the oldest technology. So they have a print head, a ribbon, a track feeder, and an impact paper. But they can also be used to do very large scale enterprise printing. Because ask yourself, before you have Lisa, Inkjet, and all of work, what have we been using to do very large scale printing all, the, the, all those times? So yeah. they can be used for industrial printing. Okay. And it will be cheaper. As analog, eh? Right, impact printers. Right, I remember yeah. when I was in banking, we normally do to print statements for the entire branch for reconciliation. So the way it is. So uh, you can they, they can they are very very rugged, uh, very very rugged. Okay, you've been in banking before. Yes, I did like two years. Okay. So you 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 have these printers. At times, they can be used for fax also. They are okay. much much older technology. So the print process. So the people move uh, past the print head vertically, uh, push the tractors or by plating the print moves, right? So you should read up and understand what the process is like for the four or five categories of printers but most especially okay. not understand which is best for what kind of session see what what, what comes out right so yeah. this comes out so old typewriters use this kind of uh technology also yeah exactly so what are going to be your maintenance replace so that's why you call these guys field replaceable units. They bad, you replace them, right? Like somebody will say, my print, my, my keyboard is bad. I want to repair it. Ah, those are FRUs. My battery is bad. I want to replace it. I want to repair it. They are FRUs. You do what? You replace. They have 3D printing. This is like the new guy in the in the block. Yeah. I want to even buy one. Right? So it does amazing stuff. Let's just uh 3D printing. YouTube, uh, let me look for a in in two minutes. Mm -hmm. So this machine printed this stuff. So it has a kind of filament. You feed the machine with the filament, and you tell it what you want it to print for you, and it will start printing. Really? Yes. What what sort of printer is this? It's called 3D. Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. I've read that before. 3D printers. Yeah, so 
I want to buy one. I was even a... That is beautiful. So you you tell you fill in what is going to print, and then you 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 fill in the material it's going to use in printing, right? Yes. What mm -hmm. the All these guys can be printed. All those guys can be printed with um, the three D printer. Yeah. 3D printer. I just got fake fake videos. Printer uh, in option. Wow, this is lovely. Excellent. Yeah, this is beautiful. And prints. These org sizes use BigQuery to uncover new insights from their data, like cost savings. Of By the time you open our UK branch channel, we we'll buy a printer like that. Like prosthetic limbs for children, actual biological tissue, working bicycles, and they've even been used by astronauts to print objects in space. So for all you Harry Potter fans out there, we're now going to show you how you can create a Harry Potter set of glasses for yourself on a 3D printer using plastic. The first step in the series is to take the digital file of this object and examine it for errors. Once you have a correct file, we can move to the next stage, which is to actually decide the print settings for this object, the speed of the print nozzle the temperature that you will melt the plastic to before printing, and many other similar details. Once you've worked out this set of settings, you feed this into the computer and then hit print. The guy can print anything. Yeah. The guy can print anything. How much of print? Exactly. You can print any model. This is brilliant. This technology is being used by people in a very wide range of sectors, including product design, architecture, aerospace engineers, jewelry design, automotive engineering, and defense. Wow. This is how you put that graphic. Yeah, so you can use it to do uh, toys, mock-ups, uh sorry no mock-ups uh 3d print you guys do typical anything so so you have uh the popular types the fuse deposition modeling uh the stereotography that's the sla so these are newer types 
Uh, with $300 there, about $250, $300, you can get an average size uh, 3D printer that will, that will serve its purpose. Uh, it's not that expensive there. Yes. If you say um, budget, budget. $300 for a 3D printer like that. Yes, 3D printer. It's now. I will start a UK branch that will have a printer like that. <laughs> so for somebody doing product design, somebody doing um uh especially product design. So most people that do manufacturing that do innovation. So you see a lot of tech hubs, people trying to create products. You want to create a product, you want even your phone pouch. You can, really? Yes, you can do your phone patch. You can do toys for kids. You can do... You gifts, can do, all these gifts. These gifts uh, gift patch. cards, all these um, key holders. The application is so numerous. Wow. Right? Uh, so I was discussing with somebody last week and uh, before I got very busy, but before the year runs out, I would love to have one and have it in any of my offices because it's a very nice stuff to behold. And yeah. I know in some places where people have like two or three of it, it's in a room. So you could go learn how to do that, how to use the printer, and decide anything you want to do, and it's been done. And you take it as a gift, and you are it's been you are, you are charged per hour or per two hours or per whatever or per session. Yeah, so exactly. You have a seven year old kid. He is taught how to do some basic stuff, and the trainer now finishes up everything, prints it in two minutes, and hand the kid over, and the kid goes. So it's very, a, very nice. Or someone that is going into manufacturing, going to shoe design, going to uh, chairs, tables, housing. You can do. You can print anything with it. You can to print. You print your your blueprint first. Yeah. Yes, you print your do your blueprint first. Then before you can now go to market. Go to site, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the filament, that's the guy that you feed into that will now start, uh, uh, what's it called? Then you have the extruder, you have the nozzle, you have the print bed, and these are the different sections of the 3D printer. So this is the process, how he does it. You need a software to do the design. Uh, then you now convert it to the printing code. Then you set this print speed, like the guy said, the quality, yeah. the temperature, the everything, ensure the correct temperature is choosing. If not, the filament, each filament type you buy will tell you the, its max. Then of course, because they all have their different melting points, then you print. Once you print, you have something beautiful coming out at the end of the day. All right, see, so look at this guy now. You have an amazing cup. So that's why it's called 3D. Because it's just going to be just like you have it. This one print it printed out bowl, eh? Yes. Anything, just think about anything, it's going to print it. So that is lovely. Yeah, maintaining 3D printer, so lubrication for heat resistance, different brushes are needed to clean different parts. Um clean the filaments between print jobs. It's important to ensure that the next job starts with the filament is clean. And with the correct temperature. Okay, let me know if you have questions. So no. in chapter three, we've looked at uh, cabling types, we've looked at connectors, we've looked at the USB standards, uh, we've looked at uh, network connector types, we've looked at RAMs, we've looked at the uh, DBRs, we looked at the um, motherboard form factors. We've looked at, um, what was it called, uh, BIOS, UFI configuration. We've looked at uh, uh, CMOS battery. You CMOS. know what CMOS battery looks like, right? CMOS battery, yeah, sure. Yes, we've, we did that. we've yes, looked yeah, at sure. power supply. Then we just looked at printers and the printer types. So new things that you have learned is cable types, cable connectors, Video types, video connectors, USB, USB speed and types, 
RG11 telephone, um, Ethernet, the series cable, lightning port, Molex. Uh, these are new items you've learned. The different uh, RAM types, the single channel, dual channel, triple and quad channel. Sync, uh, syncs where you're going to be able to have your RAM. The redundancy, the different hard disk types, the different uh, motherboard form factors, secure boot. We talked about trusted platform module, multi threading, being able to do more things. What was that M2 again? Huh? M2, M2, what was it again? L, where is it? M, M, M. Just above your, yeah. Here. Yeah. Yes. So M2 is your type of, uh, I think your type of, um, it should be your type of, uh, this should be, okay, let me confirm. Okay. Okay, an SSD that can be mounted directly on the uh, motherboard expansion slot. And uh, you know, most SSD have, Cable out of the motherboard you can connect to, but some of these these guys they look like ramps, right? Okay, yeah. So you and that's one of the reasons why we consider SSD, especially this uh, M two, this M dot two, not too good for high or very critical infrastructure, if you're not going to be having a lot of, uh, uh, what's it called, replicas or backup or redundancy, in the sense that they are very fragile. So, but these days, um, these new technologies helps us to actually have uh, what we call mirrored, mirrored, mirrored systems, where whatever I have on this SSD, whatever I have on this, uh, hard disks. I have a replica yeah. so that if anything happens, I can take up whatever I need from this place. So let me show you what it looks like. SSD drive. Yeah. So are you seeing it? It's just like it. it uh, this picture is not too clear. I see something like this. Are you seeing it? You see the way it does yes, your RAM. So, uh, so some of them can be placed on the laptop. Then you have a connector. Then some of them will have to go directly into the uh, onto the motherboard. Yes, okay, I'm comfortable. Are you there? Yeah, there. Okay, so uh, let me go back now. Okay, let me know if you have questions so far. No. So we have a virtual RAM, a single RAM, MSATA, uh, read, redundancy, I talked about redundancy, flash drives, mirroring, I just explained mirroring now. Then read uh, different form factors, uh, uh, PCIs, additional connectors, uh, different types of uh, printers and their technology, their terminologies, duplexing, pickup rollers, charging, fusing, cleaning, different types of printers yeah. and 3D printers. Okay, let's answer one question before we go. Identify the port and connector shown in the phone display. Choose from the following option. So, okay, so they are being told this guy now, sorry, this guy, this should be my uh, 20, 20 pin. Then this should be my 24 pin. 
four pin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. This is for power supply, right? Twenty-three, twenty-four. Yes, power supply. So this is my twenty-four yeah. pin, oh, and this is my twenty pin. Let me try. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six times two, twelve, right? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Five times two, ten. Yeah. Ten plus twelve. Twenty-two. Twenty-two. I'm supposed to be having twenty. Let me confirm. No, this notch, this notch is here, so I don't have a data end. Let's check the answers. Let's see the questions. So. So it is a, okay, choose from the following option. Okay, so this is the answer, right? A. Okay, identify the type of RAM in the following figure. So this is a... Product of China. <laughs> What's the product of China? <laughs> the RAM that they should. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Okay, this should be a DDR. This should be DDR2, right? Now, another thing you can memorize is your your What's it called? Your RAMs and their the notch. How many notch you have, and how many pins you have? Yes, by this way you might not be able to count. Uh, so, and you can also check to compare. Like you are seeing now, oh, it's not very clear. PC three equivalent to what? PC three. Equivalent, equivalent, equivalent to DD, DDR what? So DDR2 is PC2, DDR3 is PC3, DDR4 is PC4, DDR5 is PC5. So the number after DDR PC refers to the hyphen refers to the generation. So if we go back to this now, we have PC3 here. So this should be a DDR3. DDR3. Okay, I think that will be all for today. Uh, in the next class, we're going to be looking, so you can answer most of these questions. In the next class, we're going to be looking at uh, virtualization at cloud. So this is new, and this is a very interesting part because if you are going to do server security, server security, if you are going to do cloud computing, so this is a very, very interesting part. So we're going to be looking at chapter four in the next section.